Okay, why don't we uh, begin? So today's speaker is uh, Jeff Anderson from uh, NCAR Image, and Jeff received his PhD in geophysical fluid dynamics from Princeton University in 1990, and following that he did a postdoc at NCEP's uh, Climate Analysis Center, and then he spent a decade at NOAA's GFDL building atmospheric models, developing software infrastructure for climate models, and exploring ensemble prediction. And then in 2001, he joined NCAR as a scientist, where he leads the development of the Data Assimilation Research Testbed, which is a community software facility for ensemble data assimilation. And he has developed a number of algorithms that facilitate high-quality uh, ensemble data assimilation for geophysical problems. And today he will talk about uh, building state-of-the-art forecast systems with the ensemble comment filter. Thank you. So this is probably a little bit different than what you normally get in your colloquia. So I visit something like four to a half dozen UCAR member universities each year and try to bring them to the gospel of data assimilation. Uh, and so this is a derivative of that talk. And some of you have seen this before. I, I won't be offended if those of you I know have seen it before walk out. Uh, and I will assume that if anyone else walks out that um, they know it or the talk's just not that exciting, so um, don't feel compelled to stay. But this talk is designed to help people understand, and you've definitely seen this, Stan. Um, it's designed to help people understand uh, why ensemble data assimilation has become a thing over the past 10 to 15 years, and a little bit about what it might be able to do for you by providing you, by the end of the talk, You'll actually know everything there is to know about ensemble data assimilation. I'm a senior scientist now, which means I can reveal the fact that I don't know very much. Um, but that little nugget of stuff might be interesting to you. And so that's what I'm going to try to do, is help you to understand a little bit about what we do. And so I'm going to start out, I don't know if anyone's seen this part of the talk before. Who can I pick on? Um, I won't pick on Mashima. You've got a drink. Um, okay, so... A drink. Who's got no drink? Oh, Stan. There's no way I can get it back there. Okay. Cool. So now I'm back. So Stan and I just did a prediction problem. We had to predict where our hands were going to be to catch this thing. Okay. And amazingly enough, with that range, we both caught it. So that was a good example of building a prediction system. Okay. It was a gray matter prediction system. And so now I'm going to try a software prediction system that, in essence, mimics what we just did. And so I'm going to start out by simplifying the example I just did a little bit more. So I'm just going to resort to a two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional problem here. And so there is the trajectory of a ball through a two-dimensional space. And I want to do prediction for that system. Okay, pretty simple. So the first thing I need to do prediction is fairly obvious. I need a prediction model. And in this case, the prediction model is pretty darn simple. So it's high school physics. I've got constant velocity in the direction perpendicular to gravity, and I've got an acceleration with gravity in the direction that's uh, parallel to gravity. So there they are, two equations for my x and y coordinates. Okay. Now, Stan wasn't watching too carefully. He wasn't probably quite sure what I was going to do with that thing. Okay, Was I really going to throw it at the audience? And by the way, I will throw it at people who fall asleep. <laughs> Um, so there was some uncertainty in this whole thing. Where was Anderson releasing it? Can Anderson actually throw it that far accurately? Okay, so there's a velocity associated with this two components and the release point. And so really the best that Stan had to work with was a probability distribution, some uncertainty about exactly what the initial trajectory was. And so if you simulated that, you might get something that looks like that. So that's 50 examples of trajectories that were using the prediction model. I'm going to have real trouble catching the ball if I just use that information. Okay, it's bouncing a bunch of times in some of those. I've done throws like that at universities. It's <laughs> sailing out the back of the room in a couple of cases. I've also done things like that at universities. And so in order to build a prediction system, we need something more than just the prediction model. And so what that's going to be is an observing system, some type of measurements of what the ball is doing as it's released and after it's released. And of course, fundamentally, all observations have errors associated with them. So we're going to have some sort of noisy observations. In this idealized problem, I'm going to assume that every one half second of the two second trajectory, I have some noisy observation of the position of the ball. 
So here's one at half a second. It's a little bit off. Okay. I get another one half a second later. That one has a little bit more error associated with it, but it's after 1.5 seconds. So somehow I want to combine my forecast model with these observations to learn more than I get from either one. And that's what data assimilation is. Basically, data assimilation is a class of statistical methods that combine forecasts from a prediction model with measurements, observations from an observing system, and they result in something that is known in atmospheric circles as an analysis. could also be a posterior. There's a hundred other words in a hundred other fields, basically. We'll call it an analysis today. And this analysis is a better estimate than either of these things by combining information. So if I go back to this idealized example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a large number of samples from this initial distribution I have of the velocity and position of release of the ball. So what's shown here, I actually sampled thousands and thousands in this case. And what I've done is I've looked at the probability for any one of these trajectories after half a second that they're consistent with the observation I got after half a second. And so dark blue trajectories are likely, they're close to the observation after half a second. Light blue trajectories are less likely, they're further from the observation after half a second. Okay, and I've just kept on this plot the 50 most likely of those thousands of balls I sampled. And here they are. And I'm actually going to refer to this as an analysis, an ensemble analysis, because my analysis is composed of a whole bunch of separate estimates of where the ball is going to go. Okay, so this is a step of data assimilation. Now, I can go back here and I can use my analysis, they're just representations of the ball, as initial conditions to make new forecasts. So here we go. I've now taken these 50 estimates at time 0 0.5 and run them through my forecast model out to two seconds. So it doesn't look quite as crazy as that initial cloud. There's not a whole bunch of bouncing. There's not a whole bunch of going out of the room. And this green one is the probability weighted average of these 50 guys. So that would be Stan's best estimate of where the ball is going to be at two seconds. So not so bad, not as crazy as any of the individual ones. And now I can take this thing and say, OK, now I have this next observation. So what I'm going to do is come up with a sequential data assimilation system and basically, almost all geophysical systems that use data assimilation at this point are sequential in this sense. So now I have my forecast again. I have new observations. At one second, I can play the same game. So now, in this example of my many, many thousands of trajectories, I'm now giving them a probability that says how consistent they are with this pair of observations. Okay? So if you pass close to both observations, you have a higher probability. One thing you see is that we're starting to reduce the spread of this thing, so we're getting less uncertainty. Another thing you can see is that the darkest blue ones don't necessarily pass closest to the observation at half a second. Okay. And again, I can make a forecast, whoops, a forecast from this case. So this is from one second out, and now I've got less uncertainty out here, and my best estimate is maybe a little bit closer. And I can just keep on cycling this thing. So I can take my observation now at 1.5 seconds, play the same game, and make a forecast from there. And so by this time, maybe Stan has a pretty good chance of getting his hands underneath the ball as we've gone through this. Okay, so after the last second, he gets to move his hands over there. So just to summarize what we've learned here, this is going to be a quick sequence of those last four slides. As the forecast lead time, how far ahead I'm trying to predict something, gets shorter, my forecasts improve and the uncertainty gets less. Okay. Now similarly, I can do another type of thing with this, which may be of interest to people in HAO, and that is the notion of a reanalysis. Most of you have probably heard the idea of reanalyses that are done by weather prediction centers. 
The idea here now is I'm not necessarily trying to get the best estimate for a forecast, but I really want the best estimate of where the ball was at half a second. And I'm happy to wait a while to get some observations from the future to improve that estimate. And again, if I go through the sequence of using observations of the second on all the way up to 1.5 seconds, you can see again that my estimate of where the ball was at half a second is improving and the uncertainty associated with it, how much spread there is in these different trajectories is going down. Okay. So this example looks, to sure. So in this case, you're using a, a very simple thing, you're throwing a ball. This is not a chaotic process, unlike a lot of the processes that we do study. Um, so does that limit the, the use of this kind of thing in like sort of real scenarios that we'd actually like to use it for? So it's a great question. I couldn't have paid you better for the transition. You're I'm gonna I'm gonna come back I'm gonna come back to your comment about I, I don't know if you use the word chaos there, but this yeah. this chaos notion in a little while. But I'm going to make the transition now to, yeah, that problem was really simple. And in fact, it was deterministic dynamics, although those dynamics were sensitive to initial condition, which is sometimes how people define chaos. It's not really chaotic, but the ball spread out. Um, OK, so it was an example in a two-dimensional space, pretty simple. It turns out it wasn't quite as simple as you think, because in fact, there were two other variables going on, which were the um, components of the velocity in the x and y directions. So it turns out that really this problem was occurring in a four-dimensional phase space. And I think everyone in this crowd is probably comfortable with that notion of a phase space. So this was a four-dimensional data assimilation problem. Now, of course, big models, which we'll just see a few of at the end, big models are really big. And in fact, we're now working with billion variable models, not just 100 million. I haven't updated this slide in the past uh, month, 12 months or so. So these things are really, really big. But it turns out that from a perspective of understanding they're just following the trajectory of a particle through a phase space. And there's no fundamental distinction between the four-dimensional problem with the ball and a billion-dimensional problem that's watching how, say, WACMX traverses through this space, which is defined by the gridded temperatures and winds and uh, ionospheric stuff and whatever else. So I'm going to try and convince you now that we can come up with methods that will actually work for these really, really big problems that look like what we just did. Okay? You can re-ask the question as we get move forward. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about DART. Remember, this is an advertisement seminar, for better or worse. Okay? But the general techniques I'm talking about here are implemented in a variety of different applications. Uh, our design goals with DART were we wanted to provide entry into data assimilation to people who don't necessarily want to develop their own expertise, okay? um, but who want to use it to do model development, to do observation system development, to do other things that we'll talk about as things go on here. And so we've worked very hard to make it so you can do that with DART. Now, I don't do math very well. Okay? I tend to be a visual thinker, hence the ball example. But quickly, to try and convince you that this has some mathematical foundation and to motivate a couple of the algorithms, I'm going to go through three slides with equations and that'll basically be it. So the general description of the forecast problem can be written down like this. Equation one up here is a uh, dynamical system. You can think of it as a forecast model. It has a state vector, x. So x is this vector of all the things that allow you to make a model prediction. So again, it could be gridded temperatures, wind components, magnetic field, stuff, whatever, in your model. And so I have a deterministic part of this model. It's helpful to think about having a stochastic part of a model, even though I think most of the models in use in HAO don't actually have a stochastic component in the forecast model right now. But this could be a term sitting out here, too. So this is my forecast model. I have observations. And those observations come at discrete times for the methods I'll be describing today, so at times t sub k. And the observations are also a vector, so there might be a whole range of observations of temperatures, winds, whatever else, at a particular time, t sub k. And the essential thing is I have to have something we call a forward operator. That's this function h. h maps from the model state vector to what the observing instrument should have seen, what we think it would have seen if that were the model state. And then there is some uncertainty, noise, associated with those measurements. And that noise may come from more than just what engineers who built the instrument say. There's some random component. It could also be related to deficiency in the model and other things. But the assumption is that somehow we can get an estimate of what the instruments would observe at any time, t sub k, 
from the model state. To simplify discussion going forward for today, I'm going to assume that this instrument noise is uncorrelated in time. In other words, you can't tell me something if the instrument has an error of three today, it's not necessarily going to have the same error tomorrow. We can generalize around this, but I won't today. So to define the forecast and assimilation problem, I'm now going to define capital Y. Capital Y at some time tau is the set of all these vectors of observations from a group of times. It's the set of all observations that we're taking to at times up to and including time tau. So if I were doing a data assimilation this afternoon, Y would include all the observations I've ever assimilated of my system at any time in the past, up to and including the ones that I'm going to assimilate now. And so probabilistically now I can define the analysis and forecast problems. I'll quickly define this uh, probabilistic notation here. I think most of you have probably seen this. This one says that the probability of my state vector x for my model at some time t, the vertical line means conditioned on or given all the observations up to and including the current time t. Okay? <coughs> That's what an analysis is. I've used all those observations up till now. I have my best estimate of x. And a forecast is simply saying, okay, I want to see what the probability is at some time greater than t of my model state given all those observations that happened up to the time I started the forecast. Okay. So this is just the notation formally defining the problems I'm trying to solve. So the model state between observation times is just going to be a traditional standard forecast with your prediction model. Nothing fancy there. The only part where the data assimilation comes into play is that when I get new observations at some time t sub k, I have to take my forecast state and I have to blend in the impact of those observations, which we saw in that ball example earlier. And here I'm going to use Bayesian statistics to do this. I can write down a specific form of Bayes rule, which I won't go into detail on this form here today, but basically it says I can compute the probability of my state at time t sub k as a function of the state with a forecast made from a previous time, tk minus 1. So I can start my forecast from the assimilation I did this morning. I can then add in the information from the observations I get at tk this afternoon, and I end up with this analysis for this afternoon. I'm going to make some simplifications to this form, one of them dependent on that idea that there's no correlation in the errors between different assimilation times. I'm going to happily throw the numerator out because it's nasty and in all the methods we'll use it's going to magically disappear for us. And so I finally end up with an equation that summarizes all the data assimilation we're going to do is equation 10 here. Okay. The green term here is the forecast or prior distribution. Again, it's the probability of the model state this afternoon given all the observations that I had up till this morning. I'm trying to compute the analysis the state now, given all the observations, including the ones I just took this afternoon. And I'm going to use this term, the likelihood. The likelihood is the probability that I would have observed what I did observe this afternoon if the state of the model had a particular value. Okay. So Bayes just comes out to be likelihood from the observations prior from the forecast equals posterior. And again, the denominator goes nicely away. In a minute, I'll show you a graphical depiction of this again when we get to the common filter itself. So somehow I need to solve equation 10 to take models and observations and put them together. So I've already described to you one method called a particle filter. So what I was doing in the example of the ball was I was running all these different ensemble members. In this field, they're referred to as different particles, so all the blue things were a different particle. I was uh, evolving estimates of their probability. Okay. Then the part I didn't show you is state-of-the-art particle filters. I might have thrown out the unlikely estimates. I did that because I didn't plot the 5,000 other ones. But then I might also do an exercise where I duplicate likely estimates so really dark blue ones would get duplicated again. So it turns out that these methods can represent any probability distribution you want without limitation. Uh, so they're very powerful in that sense. Unfortunately, they scale extremely poorly for large problems, in fact, hyper-exponentially in, in some types of applications. So at present, these particle filter methods are only used in very, very small problems. There's lots of research going on to try to generalize them to large problems, but most of that is currently not successful for the type of applications that you might have in HAO. 
Okay, another method I could use to solve it. Uh, Four-dimensional variational method. So basically, this is what has been used up until recently by the best weather prediction centers, i.e. the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. The idea is basically I'm going to go back to my observations here, and I'm going to have some trajectory I start with, maybe one of the light blue ones. I'm then going to use some tricks from variational calculus applied to my model to compute a gradient that tells me what direction I should move my initial estimate of where the ball was released in order to get a better single trajectory that fits all the observations. And then, since the problem is nonlinear and all kinds of other approximations, I might iterate that thing so that I try to find progressively better and better trajectories that fit all the observations. So again, as I said, these methods are very high quality. They have been developed for weather predictions to high levels of fidelity. However, we did not choose these in DART because they require some specific coding for the model to get the gradient, something called an adjoint that some of you may be familiar with, which can be very, very difficult to code. And they only provide an estimate of the mean state. And we're really interested in providing probabilistic information to people who are doing things like model development. Another method which has been used widely in some fields that are used by HAO is the Kalman filter itself. The Kalman filter goes back to equations that we saw before. So this is the model forecast equation. This is the equation that relates observations to the model state. And it makes some very specific assumptions. It assumes that the forecast model is linear, that the observation operator that maps from state to observations is linear, and that anything random is Gaussian, normal distribution. Okay. You can violate those assumptions, but that's the assumptions that the method makes. And it's predicated on this fact that Gauss himself actually knew that two Gaussians, or two normal distributions, the product of two normal distributions is itself another normal distribution. And it's nice and simple to write down the form of the covariance and mean of the product of these two. There's in fact a weight term too, which we're going to ignore because it goes away with the denominator. So the common filter basically goes back to equation 10, and it represents the prior by a Gaussian distribution, the likelihood by a Gaussian distribution, and the posterior then comes out by that uh, result I just showed you is to be a Gaussian distribution. And so qualitatively, it looks like this. You can think of this again as being an example from that ball thing, is I have a prior that's a normal now, and so the mean position of the ball is right about here. So this is the x, y space the ball is moving out. This is probability. Uh, I get a likelihood. So this is my measurement of the position. Again, the black cross. Now I've actually plotted the uncertainty associated with that black cross. So this came from whoever built the, say, strobe camera or whatever that took a picture. It's something about the uncertainty. So this is also whoops, a normal distribution. And then the product of those things, using the equations on the previous slide, comes out to be this normal distribution here. And it makes complete intuitive sense. The estimate lies on the line between the prior mean and the likelihood mean, the observation value. And the thing is taller. We have reduced our uncertainty, so we have more probability line in the center. So this is how the common filter works. You can generalize this up to arbitrary numbers of dimensions. It's a very effective tool. There are tens of thousands of journal articles out there about it and generalizations. Um, it can be applied to all kinds of things where you start relaxing those assumptions on nonlinearity and everything else. But going back to these equations that we use to compute the mean and covariance of that product, there's a problem, and that is that each one of these matrices, when I start applying it to say Wacom X, is a billion by a billion matrix. Okay, so I cannot possibly store that matrix. I cannot possibly afford to invert matrices of that size. That's a computation that is order of n squared in the size of the matrix itself. So a naive application of a true common filter is also out of the question here. And so this led to developments that started in the mid-1990s. It took about five or six years to come to fruition to find some other way to apply something that looks like a common filter but that doesn't require storing and computing those massive matrices. So I'm going to develop here, for starters, a one-dimensional common filter, okay, really ensemble common filter, really simple stuff, but generalizes very easily again to more dimensions. So instead of representing things by a normal distribution, I'm going to represent them by an ensemble. So let's say this is an attempt to do a prediction of temperature at NCAR sometime in the winter. 
So my five prior ensemble members in this schematic here have a mean of about minus one and a standard deviation of about one. So this is some ensemble forecast that came from this morning. Okay. Uh, now all I'm going to do is completely naive. I'm going to say, well, the common filter tells me how to do stuff if I have a normal distribution. So I'm just going to take the sample mean, standard formula, sample standard deviation, standard formula, and I'm going to say that my prior is normally distributed with that mean and that standard deviation. Okay, so I just converted from an ensemble back to a representation in mean and standard deviation. When I want to make a forecast, so remember this is sequential data simulation thing, I have to make a forecast, then I have to use the observation. So forecast, I'm just going to naively say, well, if I have five ensemble members this morning, my forecast will simply be that I apply my forecast model to each one of those independently, and I'll get some distribution of the model state variables this afternoon. Okay. It turns out that we could show analytically fairly easily, I won't do it today, that that's the same as taking a linear forecast model and applying it to the probability distributions, those normal distributions. But uh, for now, you can just trust me that we can do that, that we can get our prior estimate by running individual ensemble forecasts forward. So that's the forecast thing. It's completely naive. Just run a bunch of ensembles. Now I have the question about, I've got observations. I need to incorporate them. So I'm going to take the same assumption. Here's my prior five members. I'll assume that I can fit okay, a normal distribution to them. Some instrument guy somewhere is going to give me a measurement of this temperature, so if they're Mr. Out on the deck. And that same engineer is going to tell me something about the uncertainty associated with that observation, so that's a normal by assumption. And now I can just plug it into the common filter formula, but I didn't have to invert matrices or anything else on a large scale for this one-dimensional problem. And here's what I get. Posterior is in the middle as we expected. So it is between my prior estimate mean and my observed value. In this case, because the observation had less uncertainty associated with it than my prior, it has not got as much spread, the method ends up being closer to the observed value. So this is how a one-dimensional ensemble common filter works. It's completely trivial. So now I'm going to make one additional, oh, sorry, I skipped one major step, given this talk too many times. I still have this issue that I started out with an ensemble. I got this posterior continuous distribution, but I need to get back to an ensemble that sandal, samples that posterior distribution so I can make new ensemble forecasts. And again, this can be done completely naively. All we do is shift the entire ensemble over so that its sample mean is where that continuous thing we computed is. And we linearly compact it so that its standard deviation is the same as this continuous distribution. So now I have an ensemble posterior and I can go through my sequential thing again. I make a forecast from these guys to the time when I next have observations. It all happens again. Okay, so now I've been even more sinful here. I went from four dimensions down to one dimension. I'm asking you to, to trust that this works. So there's clearly still something missing here, and that is that we have uh, talked about what happens if we have a single variable and we observe it. But now suppose, I mean, our models have lots more variables. So I've got all these other variables in the model that weren't observed, and I want to figure out what that observation does to them. So how do I do this? So let's suppose, just again, for the simplest possible example, we now have a two-variable model, temperature out on the deck here at um, center green, and temperature out at DIA. I only have an observation here at center green, but I have a prior distribution at both places. So this is a slightly funky plot here. This is a prior bivariate ensemble distribution. To make that simple, basically on the x-axis is the distribution of the observed variable, temperature outside here. The vertical axis is the temperature at DIA. I'm showing a five-member ensemble, so out here you can see the ensemble members. In general, when my prior forecast thinks it's warm here, it thinks it's warm at DIA. Okay, so there's some sort of roughly linear relationship between these things here. And what I want to ask now is, okay, I'm observing this guy. I just talked about what to do there. What do I do about this? So as a reminder, then, I'm going to blow up this marginal distribution quickly down here. So we're just going to look at that single variable problem we just did. So again, I take those five estimates. I fit the normal. There's the likelihood from the instrument. There's my posterior from the product of normals. Okay, There is my posterior distribution, these five values. By the way, the vertical coordinate doesn't mean anything for the asterisks here. Okay, It's just so we can see them separate. 
And for each one of my initial ensemble states, I can also see that I can define an increment from where my prior estimate was to where my analysis estimate is. So I get a set of five increments for these things. And what I want to do now is take those increments and somehow compute increments for the temperature out at DIA. So I'm going to go back now to this bivariate plot in the middle. So there it is. And it turns out that the most naive possible thing you can do, the thing that high school students I work with say, why don't we try this, is exactly what ends up working. So we're just going to assume that we're going to take a least squares fit here. That's equivalent to doing a linear regression. It's the same thing as actually assuming a Gaussian distribution. And so we're going to proceed like that. So there's a least squares fit through the relationship between temperature outside and temperature at DIA from my ensemble. And now I'm going to regress these increments from outside onto the temperature at DIA. And it turns out it's, not everyone has seen this graphical representation of regression. But a regression can be represented as simply projecting one by one the increments here. So that's the projection onto the least squares line. So I can project these five different increments onto the least squares line. And then I project those increments over onto the DIA variables in the same way. So there's the first projection, second, third, fourth, fifth. And so I end up getting this posterior ensemble representation for DIA. And it kind of makes sense, okay? I had an approximate linear relationship. My observation said it was really warmer outside than I thought it was. And it ends up saying, well, yeah, it's a little bit warmer out of DIA than he thought it was, too. Okay, so it turns out that I have now described to you everything that's necessary for a complete ensemble common filter. And in fact, the basic algorithms in DART, this is all they do. Okay. So I can do a schematic then of what the whole process looks like. So now I have at some time T sub K this morning, I have an ensemble of model states. So each one of these little asterisks represents the complete state vector of Wacom, let's say. So maybe millions of variables. And normally I would have to have more than three ensemble members, but to keep the cartoon simple, I'm just going to assume that I have three different ensemble members this morning. I make a forecast out to this afternoon when I have some observations. Okay. I take the first one of those observations, and I take whatever I need to do to map from my model state vector to that observation. Maybe this would be interpolating from the model gridded temperature to the location of the instrument outside on the deck. I do that for each of the three ensemble members, and I have this scalar problem now. Here are three estimates, three prior forecasts of what the temperature at this instrument is going to be. Well, we know how to solve that problem. Okay, so we get the observation. This is just what we just did. We do the one-dimensional problem to get the increments. Okay. It turns out that there are a variety of flavors of ensemble filters out there. I'm only talking about one today. And it turns out that the vast majority of the differences is in the details of this step, how the increments are actually computed from this here. But the way I did it, which was shifting and squishing, is one general method. Okay. Now I'm going to regress the impact, the increments from the observed variable out on the deck and I'm going to regress it onto every one of the state variables in the model. So not just the temperature at the next grid point over, or the temperature at the grid point there, the winds, whatever else, all the state vector elements, I regress these increments on to them. And nicely enough, it turns out that that can be done completely independently. The order doesn't matter. They can all be done in parallel. And this is where much of DART's high-performance parallelism comes from, is this particular step. So I if yeah. there are constraints like conservation laws or, or something like that, do you, is this where you um, work them in when you're, when you're... So an excellent question. So ensemble data assimilation out of the box does not explicitly respect any conservation law, and it's something that users should be aware of. The hope is that because your prior distribution of ensembles has been integrated in a model that respects those conservation laws, if the model does, that when you do these statistics, you will mostly continue to honor the conservation laws. And there is good theoretical evidence to support that mostly continues to respect. If you need a particular type of conservation, you should assume, all, everything else being equal, that the data assimilation may destroy that. And that's a problem that you would have to consider um, how you respond to that. And we have a lot of expertise thinking about that in our team, but it is definitely a good question. Okay, so I've um, updated all the state variables. If I have another observation now, I can compute its forward operator and go through this loop. It turns out that you can go through the observations sequentially in normal distribution, which is a thing of beauty. And when I've finished with all the observations at this time, I'm ready to go on and make my forecast um, for this evening when maybe there's a new set of observations. 
So that's the entire thing to a basic ensemble common filter. And so this is where we were in about 1999. Um, first of all, we were having people telling us we were crazy to use ensembles of, say, 100 that you could afford in a model with, at that point, 10 million variables. And uh, maybe those people were right. So this is a model I'm going to play with. It's just a toy model, but it will demonstrate some of the challenges that we face here. And it helps you understand what you need to do to make it work in Wacom. So this is a 40 variable model that uh, Ed Lorenz developed in 1995. That's why it's called the Lorenz 96 model in the DA literature. Um, you can think of it, Lorenz like to think of it as a proxy for the pressure or height of a weather around a latitude band. He has a paper where he describes this as being sort of waves moving in weather across 40 degrees north. Anyway, in this case, there are these 40 grid points, and you can see that there's some sort of dynamics going on here. This is a, a system that is referred to as chaotic. It's definitely sensitive to initial conditions. And we can see that what I'm going to do next is I'm going to introduce 20 ensemble members, and each ensemble member will look almost identical to the red. It's just going to have a tiny bitwise difference between the red at the initial time. And I'm going to start running a forecast that has the red, which I'm going to call the truth. Okay, I'm going to simulate a real world with this red. And then the blue things will start out, and originally they look quite a bit like the red, but before you go very far, they start growing chaotically, if you will. And after a while, this just looks like mush. Each one of the blue ones looks like some sort of independent draw from a climatology of the red model or something else. So what I want to do with data assimilation now in this problem is I'm going to make some synthetic observations of the red. So I'm going to take, I'm going to define 40 different observing stations. There's going to be more observing stations towards this edge of the domain, fewer over to this edge of the domain. And at each observing station, every few time steps, I'm going to take the true value of the red curve interpolated to that point, and then I'm going to add in a random draw from a normal simulation of error for the instrument. So I'm going to add in a random number with a zero mean and a four standard deviation. And so as I start going through this, you'll see green asterisks that will appear here. Those are the noisy observations, so they'll be somewhere close to the red curve, but not exactly on it. And I'm going to use this ensemble technique that I talked about before to assimilate and adjust the blue curves with those observations. So here we go. So very quickly, after the first assimilation time, you can see that the blue curves got a lot closer to each other than they were. Okay, so we cut down on this uncertainty that we had in our original very uncertain prior. And now you can see going along in time, uh, the blue curves have much less variability. We would refer to this as spread in the ensemble data assimilation community. So there's a lot less spread. Um, but I'm looking at this and I'm not all that happy. So this is supposed to be analyses and short-term forecasts of the red with the blue. Remember in the two-dimensional ball example, those blue things were all clustered around the actual location of the ball. That looked good. This doesn't look very good. Okay, so the truth, the red, seems to be very often a long, long way away from all the ensemble members. Okay. So this is where we were in 1999. Even in a 40-variable model, this stuff just doesn't work. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? So you have to go back and examine what are we doing where we're making assumptions that maybe we're violating. So this is back to that schematic picture I showed of what data assimilation looks like. And it turns out that the first order problem we discovered was this. When we do that regression of the increments of the observation onto the state variables, we're assuming that this 20-member ensemble is actually giving us an accurate regression coefficient. Okay. But really, it's kind of like a random draw, a 20-member draw from a bivariate distribution or a higher dimensional distribution. And I can do things like look at the error associated with computing a correlation, which is part of the regression coefficient, from that. So all this plot shows is if I have a bivariate distribution, two variables that have this correlation, well, that would like to get a computation that gives the black curve, so my computed correlation from my ensemble is the same as the true one. But it turns out that with small ensembles, for instance, this green curve shows a 20-member ensemble, when you go down to close to zero correlation, you, by chance, get things that appear to be correlated. So the absolute value of the correlation you get on the average, the average amount that the observation impacts something it shouldn't impact at all, is actually about 0 0.18. Okay. And so we had to do something to get rid of these spurious relationships, spurious correlations between observations and state variables. And the naive way to start doing this was basically to just throw away the impact of observations on state variables that you think they're weakly correlated with. We do things that are a little bit more sophisticated than that now, but this is an example of doing that. 
This is a repeat of the case I showed you before with the assimilation. This one up here is the same observations, the same truth. It started with the same blue ensemble members, but now it's using this idea that observations here are only being allowed to change state variables that are kind of close to where they are. The observation that's over here is only being allowed to impact state variables over there. Okay? And again, the term for this is localization. And you can see that in general, things are looking much, much better here. Our blue uh, estimates from our forecasts are much closer to the red, and the uncertainty associated with the blue is such that in most of the instances, the red is lying inside that estimate. Okay? So this is a much happier result. And so this was the first thing that allowed people to start seriously considering doing this. And it turns out that this is not a dimensionally trapped result. So you can take this and put it in an atmospheric general circulation model like Wacom, and just this simple trick of localization will allow you to suddenly assimilate with an ensemble with 20 or 40 members in that massive phase space. And it turns out these are the localizations that were used. This was automatically computed localizations. And one of the things DART provides is attempting to help you with these additional pieces of the algorithm, which can require expert knowledge in some cases. And so these were automatically computed examples of where, say, this particular observation, it only impacts state variables right in here with full weight. And out here, it doesn't impact them at all. OK, great. So now we can go back to this uh, error sources, because another problem is going to rear its ugly head really fast. And that is this issue of model error. Up till now, I've been using a forecast model that's exactly the same as the model that produced the truth. And that's great. Um, I've worked a little bit with Wacom, with Nick and other people. It's not quite perfect. Um, <laughs> what? Sorry, sorry to, yeah, I'm leaving now. It's not quite perfect. And you can blame CGD's part of the model somehow probably did that. I know if you'd done it all yourself here, it would be perfect. OK, but there's this issue of model error. OK, so we're working with forecast models that have all kinds of problems. So I'm going to simulate that back in this context of this Lorenz 96 model. Each one of the 40 variables indexed by I here of the Lorenz 96 model has an equation that looks like this. And there's this constant forcing term F sitting out there. I've been using f equals 8 for the truth, and that's, this is a time evolution now of one of those 40 state variables. So with f equals 8, it looks like the blue curve. I'm now going to change to f equals 6, and you can see that it quickly changes from the blue. So now what I'm going to do is my truth is still the same one as before. It was generated with an f equals 8, but I'm going to try to assimilate that now with a model. All of my blue model curves are generated with this slightly different model that uses f equals 6. Okay, so now the localization is the same, the truth is the same, the observations are the same. Okay. And initially, it oh, doesn't look so bad after a few steps. Maybe this is just going to work. Uh, but if I sit here and keep watching, well, I'm starting to see again a lot of places where the red isn't really inside the blue. It's trying to kind of hold on. And if I had time to sit here with you for the next five minutes, this would just get worse and worse as we continue going out. And so again, so around 2001, 2000, this is where we were with this problem now. This thing still doesn't work okay. as soon as we try to use a real model. Yep. Does the way in which it failed tell you something about the bias of the model? Um, yes, in fact. And we'll come back to that quickly when I show some slides from some of Nick's um, results in a minute. But, but for now, we need a, a solution to this problem. And again, something completely naive turned out to work fairly well. So. In some sense, the problem was our blue curves, they think they've got the right answer because they believe that f equals 6 model. And so I got all these blue curves that are close together. And somewhere up here is the red from the f equals 8 model. So my prior, my forecast, it's too confident. It's too confident because it doesn't know the model is wrong. And there's this uncertainty associated with that. And so the completely naive thing to do is if these are my five forecast members of temperature outside again, I'm just going to add in some additional uncertainty. I'm going to say, you really don't know as much as you do in this forecast. There's some other problems. So we're just going to spread you back out away from the mean. So you can see here inflating these things out. It's called inflation. And so we can go back to this example. Again, everything's the same as we just saw here as the case before. This case here now is using an inflation that's again being estimated by an additional algorithm that DART provides that goes beyond the standard ensemble common filter. It takes a little while for this to spin up, but what's happening here, this is an estimate of the amount of inflation, the amount that the ensemble must be moved out from its mean before you assimilate. And if we continue to watch this, you'll see that this is working uh, much, much better than down here. And the sense in which it's working better is that 
the red truth is lying inside the blue forecast estimates. In some cases, for instance over here, there may be much more uncertainty, more spread in the blue estimate than there is down here. But in fact, this is a better forecast because the probabilities associated with that are consistent with the truth. Okay? In fact, we didn't have enough information given that we don't know what's wrong with the model to make a really good forecast down here. And so we're left making an uncertain forecast. So it turns out that in general, good inflation and good localization, and getting them good is not trivial, is enough to lead to really high quality forecast systems in big models. And so in essence, DART provides tools to do ensemble common filters with guidance on doing these other additional algorithms to make good systems. Okay, and that's what we try to do. I'm going to give just a couple quick examples of some things that have been going on in HAO in collaboration with uh, the DART software team. Uh, the first one is work with Nick and Han Lee in the back. Um, and so they did, I have to be a little bit careful because I'm using the term slightly different. They did a after the fact analysis forecast system for Wacom from the surface to the lower thermosphere. And so the model configuration they used, um, is it accurate to say it went up to 145 kilometers? Is it? Well, the model does. The model does. No, I get that. So the model goes up to 145 kilometers. And they assimilated two different classes of observations. The first thing they did was basically what NCEP does for weather every day in the troposphere. These are actually the same observations they assimilated that NCEP assimilates to do numerical weather prediction. And here, this is just looking at a particular level of analysis in the troposphere at 500 hectopascals. Uh, this is a height field. This is from the NCEP reanalysis, which is their sort of state-of-the-art product. This was produced by Wacom and Dart. It's the ensemble mean of, of this field. And you can see, and we know from other verification much more carefully, this is a fairly good representation of the NCEP reanalysis. And in fact, uh, this particular time, I don't know if you know this, so this is a storm dropping into uh, Colorado down the back of this trough here. It's kind of a random. So it was a random, <laughs> random chance. So the forecasts that you get from Wacom plus Dart are roughly the same as NCEP got from their operational system in about 2005. Okay, so if NCEP goes out of business, you guys can go into business um, selling stuff to Panasonic and IBM. Now, in addition, they also assimilated some observations in the middle and upper atmosphere. Okay, and they did this with a 40-member ensemble. This is a, addressing one of your things. One of the things that this type of assimilation can help you do is identify more information about the model biases. It's basically letting you compare those model biases in a systematic way to the available observations. And I won't go into the details here. This is uh, Nick and Hanley's work. But just as an example, if you run Wacom on its own, uh, this is an example of temperature, I think, at 5 times 10 to the minus third hectopascals. If you do it with the data simulation, you get something that looks like this. And so you can see that it's moved the model away from a systematic bias towards the observations. It is non-trivial to take this type of information and decide how to fix the model. But in fact, you guys did come up with some fixes to the model that were driven uh, by data simulation discovery. So. And uh, they go on to point out that uh, it helps to simulate stratospheric sudden warmings. It can help you with the chemistry that occurs on um, with those events. So one thing you can do is move your atmosphere to places that look like the real world and then allow you to do science in a model that's closer to where the real world is, um, in addition to helping you find systematic errors. Another example is work with uh, Masumi, who's been doing a variety of assimilation in different uh, solar dynamo models. This particular example was very similar to what I just showed you with the Lorenz 96 model in that she's starting out doing an observing system simulation experiment. She generates her own truth by integrating the model. Then she's going to generate synthetic observations from that truth and she's going to see what happens if she assimilates them. And so in this particular case, the truth is under there in blue, evolving in time. And the ensemble is here in green. And she's just used a single observation here. And so she's pointing out, as she could have shown you a control, that with even one observation, you do fairly well in reconstructing the truth here. We did not use good localization in this example, which might have helped with this single observation. But what she can go on to do is then use a much larger ensemble and find that she gets an excellent reconstruction like this. So her ensemble and her ensemble mean in red are just completely blotting out the blue truth that's underneath there. This allows her to go ahead and do things called observing, simulation, observing system simulation experiments. She can ask questions about where she might have observations and what the characteristics of those observations might be, and then see how 
assimilating those observations in this controlled case works as a preliminary step to assimilating real observations uh, with this model. And so um, I think we found it helpful to understand a little bit more about this model and what the observing characteristics would need to be to do a successful prediction with a model that looks something like this. The final thing I'll mention is uh, coming soon to a supercomputer near you from a variety of people here in the room uh, will be a DART WACMX assimilation capability. And the development on that is still proving challenging in a number of ways because uh, WACMX isn't that happy about being integrated in an ensemble mode at the moment, but you're going to convince it, right? Soon. <laughs> yeah. So the model is being convinced to do this. Uh, one thing I will point out again, so this is non-trivial cost. One of the really important things on the Dart software, again, is that you could go away and write your own ensemble common filter, and you could get my code, it's all public domain, to do adaptive inflation and localization. The stuff that we work really, really hard on that makes Dart unique is that we work very, very hard to allow it to run efficiently on computing from laptops to Yellowstone to DOE supers to wherever else you're getting your computing time. And so Dart is extremely efficient on high-end supercomputers with big problems. We're always continuing to improve that. And hopefully it will not be so expensive to do WACMX that it will preclude some science moving forward. Uh, so I will stop there. Uh, if anyone's interested in getting more information, you can go to our website. If you have your phone, uh, this is our website. This is the uh, BAMS uh, Bulletin of the Atmospheric of uh, the American Meteorological Society article that gives background into the system and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks. So when, uh, nice talk, by the way. Uh, so when making predictions, often you want to know not just what the most likely temperature or state is, but uh, what is the likelihood of extreme events? <clears throat> so two questions with regard to that. Does Ensemble common filtering offer an advantage over the variational approaches for that. And the second question is, do you ever have to worry about non-Gaussian probabilities okay. in those situations? So all excellent questions. The first thing I'm going to clarify one of your questions, you asked about extreme events. Mm -hmm. And if you mean extreme events, that's different than meaning unlikely events. And there's actually been confusion in the tropospheric literature about that. that Clarification is related to your comment about um, non-Gaussian distribution. So the bottom line is that one is hoping that these ensemble members actually sample the distribution of your possible forecast given the history of observations you have. So that is what we would like in the best case scenario. In other words, you could take any one of the 40 forecasts with Wacom that Nick has made and view them as being an equally likely scenario when you make a forecast or when you look at the analysis. If one of those has an extreme event, you might be tempted to say the probability of the extreme event is approximately 1 out of 40. And there has been quite a bit of success in doing that in the troposphere and the ocean and some other applications. Caution is needed, however, because uh, there is always a need to uh, calibrate and validate any forecast system because there's all kinds of other assumptions here. The model clearly does have errors. If those errors are big enough, all bets are off. So the answer is possibly, but don't believe it until you've proved it to yourself. So you have to make some set of forecasts, compare those to observations after the fact to convince yourself that the ensembles are really giving you some good estimate of the probability distribution. I've been thinking about this notion of localization because as we um, as we move toward the ionosphere and, and similar related systems um, the, the there is a great degree of interconnection between various parts of the world but they're not necess it's not necessarily as simple as simple proximity um, the, the example that comes to mind is I, I, in, the, in the earlier days uh, when we were doing uh, the assimilative mapping of ionospheric electrodynamics, the AMI right. thing, uh, you, know, you got sparse sampling of the, of the oral conductances, and so, so they, would, uh, they would only allow the model to pay attention to those conductances in the proximity of the satellite tracks. And what you'd get, these blobs, it didn't look anything like the aurora. 
But in fact, a satellite track sampling does have information about where the aurora is elsewhere on the globe because right. the thing tends to expand and contract as an oval, as we know. And, and there's many other examples in the ionosphere, uh, for instance, that are like that. The separation of the equatorial anomalies or the depth of the mid-latitude drops, all these things. So how, I, I guess, maybe DART already can do all this, but, but how, how do you expand this notion of localization to, uh, to be global in nature, but having some sort of knowledge of sure. the underlying pattern, or maybe maybe even the, the, the acronym EOF comes to mind okay. in this context. So this has actually been the primary focus of my research for almost the last decade now, is understanding localization better. And what you're saying is entirely accurate. In the troposphere, people have gotten away in general with this notion of proximity, just have the thing decay. There's some exceptions because there's some non-local observations in the troposphere, for instance, if you're looking at a GPS occultation track, that's going to be correlated with stuff along its track. If you're looking at a radiance looking down, that's going to be correlated with stuff along the uh, view, field of view. So to first order, studying the ensemble correlations gives you quite a bit of guidance into what you need to do. So if you can determine when you're doing ensemble stuff with a subset of observations that you think are local, if you can find that there's a non-local correlation pattern, that can provide you your first hints as to where you need to be looking for <clears throat> these non-local, I mean, the, the term is there, relationships. Some of the tools that come with DART are designed, in fact, to discover these localization things when they're not spatially local. The real thing we're interested in is statistical locality, what things are related. So we provide some tools. I won't kid you that the hardest part of getting a system up and working with something new, especially with complex observations, is in fact better understanding how to localize. So in addition to tools, we provide some expertise on doing that too. Certainly a legitimate question, but I don't think unsolvable either. So I just have a conceptual question, going back to your example in the beginning of the, of the balls and the trajectories. When you were doing the ensemble, you were going all the way back to the beginning to do the, to do the trace. Is it a correct interpretation in the in the meta meta frame to think about an ensemble common filter of only taking one particular snapshot, <clears throat> doing a distribution there, and then running forward from that and keep keeping going forward that way in the in the prediction system, so you don't have to go all the way back through all your history of observations to get your improved forecast? Or is that yeah? So your intuition is is correct, and in fact, I mentioned in passing after I did the example, I started going through methods, and the first method I said was particle filter. I mentioned that what you're describing was sort of the most naive particle filter. The way particle filters themselves are made smarter, I mentioned, was you discard some trajectories, you duplicate others, you don't go all the way back to the start and run a whole bunch more when you need them. And in fact, let's not talk about variational right now, but all the ensemble slash particle methods in any practical application, they really are forward. You're not going back and and running more and more forecasts from some time in the past. You're done with your forecast in the first half second. You don't repeat that part. You use the observation information to either update uh, that distribution or duplicate some members of it to go forward. Jeff, I was wondering for the, you mentioned other methods like uh, 40 bar, uh, and uh, is there any like valuation uh, in real models, in the operational model centers? Do they evaluate uh, how does those methods compared with the, this uh, uh, sample method? So, so absolutely. So that's the story of, of much of my data assimilation career. So initially, the operational tropospheric centers um, were doing various forms of variational, and were convinced that this could not be competitive. And so we spent sort of from the late 90s through the mid to late 2000s convincing the operational centers that these things could be competitive with variational methods. Where, where numerical weather prediction is, is a totally different ball game from where most people I think here who might be interested in data simulation are. The tiniest increments in improved performance are things that massive amounts of resource will go into. And in fact, the best assimilation system is still the European Center's 4D VAR. Almost all the other operational centers have gone to 
uh, hybrid methods that use ensemble filters at their core now, but may use some additional bells and whistles that look a little bit like variational stuff. But in fact, everybody except ECMWF has given up on pure variational methods because of the difficulty in generating these adjoint codes. I get into a weird situation now in that I go to meetings where for 15 years, I would argue at these meetings, ensemble methods can be competitive. Ensemble methods can be competitive. They can. And now I'm in the position of saying, don't abandon the variational methods. Don't abandon them. Because uh, if I could get an adjoint cheaply and easily, I would probably throw Dart out the window and I would write a variational data simulation system. Because if you can get a good adjoint, it's a really powerful and efficient tool. And there is still hope out there. Adjoints can be generated by automatic differentiation of forecast model code. And as long as your forecast model follows certain rules, which are kind of restrictive, you can actually get good adjoints automatically. And the problem is when you have uh, parameterizations, for instance, that have if statements in them are uh, bad for, for adjoints. There is still a distinct possibility that sometime in the next few years, the proper breakthroughs in software may bounce us back on a trajectory more towards variational. But for now, ensemble methods are highly competitive with other methods. And if you don't have the resource to generate an adjoint, they're um, the best method right now. Could, could you say, explain what you mean by adjoint just a little, a little more? Yeah, so I we've gone through this, but so so I can. So. The first thing you need, so what you need this adjoint for is you're trying to compute a gradient with respect to your model state variables at the start of some forecast period. You want to find what direction to change your gridded T, U's, and V's so you better fit the next, say, 48 hours of observations. To do that, you start by getting a linear tangent version of the model. And you're, I think you're probably comfortable with making a linear tangent version. Okay, So the adjoint. Your linear tangent model could be written as matrix A. The adjoint is A transpose. Okay. And so if you could actually write down the matrix for A, the linear tangent version of, of Wacom, you could just flip the rows and columns, and that would be the adjoint, and you could apply that. And applying that backwards in time, it turns out, actually gives you the gradient. The reason it's hard is you can't get that whole matrix A. Um, it's big, it's messy, it's complicated. And so what you really want to do is generate a code that does A, and then you want to generate a code that does A transpose. And it turns out that that is um, potentially tricky still. As I was saying, there's still hope that that could be effectively automated sometime in the near future, but people have been working on that for 30 years, and um, it still takes ECMWF uh, person decade or something every time they upgrade the model to update the adjoints too. That's a resource I don't have for 30 different models. Did that help? It strikes me that, that, uh, that one reason that this is evolving may be simply that, that uh, it's, it's sort of the ensemble methods are sort of inherently scalable. I mean, maybe that's true of data simulation in general, but I mean, you know, if your model isn't really that efficient, I'm thinking specifically about Wacom X in so terms this, of using a lot of processors. Yeah. Well, if you're going to run dozens of instances of it, you're going to be using lots of processors anyway. And since since the trend is towards more processors that aren't getting any faster. So that uh, is one reason. The other real reason, I'll be honest with you, is it's just so much easier. Right? So our original motivation was it was so easy compared to what an operational center had to do with with the whole adjoint stuff. That's that's why the original design decisions on Dart being ensemble were made. It was just it was something we could do with a small team. Alright, if there are no more questions, I want to thank Jeff again.